Hello and welcome everyone to another Invent Right webinar, Master the Art of Licensing. Over there on the left is myself um, and my business partner, Stephen Keyes, the guy with the glasses. I'm the guy that, next to him. And we have been coaching and mentoring inventors to license their products for royalties for the last 21 years. We've had students in over 65 countries. And since the pandemic started, we've been doing these free webinars for the inventing community. And you guys have really, really liked it. And we've appreciated your great questions that you guys asked during these webinars. Um, so, oh, I noticed Stephen just joined. There he is. I thought it was going to be a few minutes late, but he just got in. Hey, Stephen, how you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. I, we just got started, so you didn't miss anything, man. Hey, Haven't Patrick, even... how you doing? Hey, pretty good. How are you guys? Uh, fantastic. Thank you for coming on tonight. No problem. So, Patrick, uh, Patrick is a, a, a patent searching expert. And he's going to teach you guys how to do patent search. Uh, Stephen, do you, do you think the average inventor is really good at patent searching, or do you think most of them can learn a thing or two? What are your thoughts? Well, I think it's really important to learn how to do it. I think it's also important that if you hire somebody, which I highly recommend if you're serious going forward, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, that you've done some of the work yourself and you understand it and you can communicate a little bit better for whoever's gonna do that search for you. Mm -hmm. So it's important to learn how to do it, Andrew. And and I don't think you're ever gonna be, I don't think anybody can find everything. But before we start with this, and let me tell you why I think this is so important. And Patrick, I'm so happy you're on. Thank you very much. No problem, yeah. Um, knowing your point of difference is extremely helpful. And it helps in so many different ways. Knowing your point of difference of your invention compared to other inventions that, that have patents is going to help you tremendously, not only in getting your patent, because if you know some of the prior patents and you know what some of the obstacles are, that when you do file a non-provisional patent application, and you know what's ahead of you, and that's a patent examiner is going to find, then you can redesign, rework, and make it sure that when they find it, you can actually, well, first of all, you're not surprised and scrambling and think that you wasted all this money, but you're prepared for it. That's why this, this searching is so important. But more than that, when you understand your point of difference, when a potential licensee asks you, hey, do you have an intellectual property? And I know there's a lot of prior art. Of course, there's prior art on everything. And, and when someone asks you that, that, that question, you can come back with a great answer. You can say, of course, there's a lot of prior art. Yes, but let me tell you why mine is different. Let me tell you my point of difference. Now you turn that question into a selling point. And that's why to know the landscape of the prior art is really important, not only to help any obstacles at the USPTO with the patent examiner, but also to sell, to license your invention. Knowing that gives you strength and knowledge, and it gives you confidence and gives that company confidence to go forward to say, yes, let's do this. So that's why this this class tonight is so important. So mm -hmm. definitely, thank you. thank you for that, Stephen. Uh, so yeah, so yes, you can do a patent search on your own, and it's amazing all the stuff that you can find. And and the more you do it, the better you're going to get at it. But if you're going to hire somebody, I think with Stephen and I, we, we always say to folks is you should always if if you have these skills and you're going to learn some of those skills tonight with Patrick. You should always do a patent search on your own so you can provide the patent searcher with more information. They're just going to do a much better job that yeah. way. And that's not very intuitive. I don't think most people are like, well, either I'm either going to do it on my own or I'm going to pay somebody to do it. But, um, you know, the patent searcher, just like a patent attorney, is only as good as the information you give them. So the, if you've done some searching and you can make some comments about stuff you found, Wow, I, I think they're going to do a better job. What do you think, Patrick? Uh, absolutely. I was going to jump in on Stephen there and emphasize that the best 
the best searches always start with uh, an inventor coming in or an attorney coming in and saying, we're aware of this one or two or three patents. We've looked them over and we have, we have some differences with what we're doing and we want you to focus on those differences. And it's kind of like what Stephen, Stephen was calling your, your key uh, or your key point. Uh, that is where you're, that's how you're going to get the most, uh, the most bang for your buck, especially when you're, when you're doing the patent search, but that's how you're going to get your best results. And it matters so much because, uh, you, if you submit a patent app application today, depending on the art field, you could be sitting here waiting for two or three years. I mean, in some areas it's one year, some areas it's five years. Uh, and all that time, you know, you're not going to, you're, you're not going to sit and wait with your business. You're going to be out there uh, doing this, and you don't want to have a surprise in three years. So, yeah, this is this is an important first step. Well, Patrick, I turn, I'm turn i turning the screen over to you so you can share your screen. You can show us some stuff. Um, he's a pro, guy, so um, pay close attention. You're going to learn a lot tonight. Uh, okay. All right, yeah. So, like, like they were saying, my name is Pat Walsh, and I've been doing patent searching for about 15 years. Most of my customers are attorneys, but I, you know, maybe a quarter of them are inventors or companies. And um, I, you know, I have resources here uh, that most most people would not have, including, you know, some paid resources, some homemade. I've got contractors at the PTO, so there are all these different ways to get this done. But there's also, fortunately, these days, there are a lot of good free resources. So we're gonna. We're going to get a look at some of those tonight. Um, let's see. First, I want to talk a little bit about the different kinds of patent searching. So inventors are most interested in patentability and freedom to operate, but there's a lot of other types of searches that you might hear people talk about. But the ones that we're going to talk, the one we're going to talk about is patentability. Um, but I also I just want to mention freedom to operate because that is something that inventors often get confused with patentability. Freedom to operate is where you're trying to figure out if you're going to uh, infringe on somebody else's patent, whereas patentability is where you're trying to figure out if you can get a patent. And I always I usually tell people that the uh, the freedom to operate search and opinion that's a ten thousand dollar question and the uh, patentability as far as just getting a search and opinion by an attorney that's more like a thousand dollars and it's really it's where inventors most often start is with the patentability so let's see so now we're going to talk a little bit about prior art prior art is anything that published before the date of your uh, patent application. So that can include that can include magazine articles, that can include websites, that can include uh, Kickstarter campaigns, and obviously it can include U.S. and non-U.S. patents and patent publications. So I usually, for patentability, I rely on the uh, the customer to be aware of their uh, aware of their market so generally you know they're they should they should already know what what competitors are out there selling we focus on the patent and in particular we start off with a u.s patent search and then expand out to the foreign uh, or to the non-us patent so we're going to take a look at how to do a u.s patent search to get things started but Patrick, are you saying that most patent searchers want the inventor to have studied the marketplace and know what else is out there? Because anything that's selling in the market is prior art as well. And do do you find inventors do that, or do they sometimes not do that? They what sometimes, are the issues? yeah, they sometimes uh, are unaware, and in some cases, they they put themselves out of the patent market by uh, by by publishing their own information too early, such as in a Kickstarter campaign or you know, just by offering their their uh, their product for sale prior to uh, pr well, okay, it gets a little tricky. It's it's worth talking to an attorney, but just the general rule is that it's uh, it's wise to get yourself filed before you make a public disclosure or a public offer for sale of your own invention, because because the patent office can come in and uh, 
if they find a website that existed and you put it up and it existed more than a year before you uh, more uh, more than a year before you filed they will use that against you uh, in the proceedings and that's you know that can be a detector because uh, because there's nothing that's going to look more like your invention than your invention so they have they have a perfect case against you uh, so basically it just you, prior art is anything that's out there no matter who puts it out there got it okay so let's take a look at some let's take a look at some patents so these are u.s patents and u.s patent publications patents like I say, for a patentability search, we are concerned about everything. So you go back to the 1700s, 1800s, uh, you know, a couple hundred years of patents. Publications have been around for about 20 years. Uh, so between the two of them, you've got about 20 million US documents, you know, maybe 11 million patents and 8 million publications, roughly. So, you know, it's a huge data set. Um, fortunately, we are, we use computers to do it. Believe it or not, like 25 years ago, the guys down at the patent office used to look at all this on paper, which is, it's hard to, it's hard to even fathom today, but yeah, so about 20 million U.S. documents and then well over 100 million uh, U.S. and non-U.S. documents. So if we take a look at these, uh, if we take a look at these documents, uh, I wish I wish you could see it a little bit better, but you can see that there's uh, a title, an abstract, and there's usually a figure right on the cover. So those are the primary things that we're going to be interested in uh, when we when we get going with a patent search. Uh, things like the claims, we're just not going to worry about those because the claims are a subset of the the, the description of the uh, patent. So all the, the information contained in the claim should be in the description and it should be more in plain English. So we'll just, we won't worry much about the, uh, uh, about the claims. These are some of the free resources that I'm gonna show tonight. And I can get these over to um, Andrew to uh, send out. The most important are the top three. One is Google Patents which I, as far as free resources goes, I think that's about the best one out there. And the reason is obviously it's fast. Um, it's, it's Google, you know, so you, they, they don't rely on you having too much knowledge just the same way that you Google for anything. Uh, and they also, they show images right on the, uh, the cover, which is uh, like the USPTO website, they make it a little bit more difficult to see images. So it's just kind of nice to have everything right there. Another another resource here that I'll show you is uh, thesaurus.com. So when we get into naming out the elements of the invention, we're gonna need to develop a few keywords and having a resource like, uh, like that is helpful. These other ones here are just uh, some more free search engines. Two of them are for the USPTO. One is for the uh, the uh, the patents and one is for the the applications. This search engine is um, I can tell you that they haven't made an upgrade to that in the whole time that I've been looking at it. So it's it's very you'll feel like you're in the early 2000s when you look at that one. Just the fact that you have to go to two different websites to look at patents and publications kind of tells you something. The uh, the next two are for doing a little bit of international searching, but like I say, with Google, you can just uh, just click a few buttons and you can get a lot of international uh, art. So next, let's take a look at a sample invention because this is what we're going to do a quick little search on. This is one that I've been using for years uh, and it relates to um, quitting, quitting smoking. Uh, this is a, uh, a box that, that contains cigarettes. It's got a timer and every, you know, at, at a given interval, it'll release uh, one cigarette and then it'll keep on making the, that interval longer until you're, I guess, until you quit. So that's, that's the invention. And if you get over to, uh, if you can open up a spreadsheet or just jot it down on paper, this, this is, it's helpful, it's very helpful to be organized when you're doing a patent search because this is an activity that you're gonna be engaged in 
you know, for multiple hours. Um, so it's organization is really the, the key to make sure that you don't, you know, start repeating steps and so on. So here I listed out what I call the elements on the left side. And you can just take a look. One relates to quitting, one relates to a container, one relates to a lock. This is the timer. And then progressive is just, you know, indicating this, uh, this increasing amount of time um, over time. And then, so next, uh, we need to develop some keywords that relate to those elements. And like I say, you see that uh, uh, the elements are just listed very simple um, as one um, as one uh, one word. So let's see here. Where is space for? So if you just come up to, I mean, and there's a lot of web resources like this, but if you just plug in uh, one word like uh, container, you'll see that it gives you a bunch of words, and you can just go and go through and pick pick out pick out words that you think will be uh, used in describing the invention, and you'll see that I came up with a. This is my standard list of container-related words right here. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. This is my standard list of container related words right here. And then here's a standard list of timing related words, all related to time, obviously. Progressive, you can see. And I just, you know, I just developed these words by doing a little bit of uh, searching around. Wikipedia is also useful for just about everything I do. But Thesaurus.com is where I came up with, uh, <laughs> with these lists of keywords. So next, we would go over to Google Patents. And you can see that the URL is right here, patents.google.com. And here is the uh, search field that accepts both text and subclass. Here are some other fields that you know, are less important, like uh, the date related Fields are not as important for patentability because, like I say, we're just in, we're interested in everything regardless of uh, when it published. So back to the 1700s up to today, inventor sometimes, but you know, for for patentability, I I almost never know the name of the, of an inventor that I'm interested in. Inventor, you may know some people because you're you're out in the field. You know, you know, like who's who, what companies are making things, what people are prolific in an area. Um, SNA refers to companies that uh, that are the owners of patents, so it's the same thing. It's more that's more like market knowledge. For me, it's it's rare that I would use that kind of stuff uh, when I'm when I'm doing a uh, patentability search. And then down here, there's just one selection that I've made. You'll see that I put it on U.S. And like I was saying before, everything is in play. All of the you know, Chinese and European and uh, WIPO, every, everything is in play if it's been published. Uh, but just to make things easy on ourselves to get going, uh, I always just start with US because US patents, obviously they're, they're published in English, they're very well uh, written, uh, they're well classified, uh, classified meaning um, the, uh, the classification schedule that's used. I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit. So it's just like, it's a way of uh, making things a little bit easier on yourself to get started. So here we are, let's just, um, we can start putting in some of these, uh, some of these, uh, some of these words, and we won't even worry about synonyms right now. We're gonna get so much of this stuff. Uh, and you can see that everything is, that these, these lists are coming up very quickly over here. And uh, I've already got one. I'm gonna like fast forward about a half an hour because you know, patent searching is like that. It just, it goes, it, it, it's not, it's, unfortunately it's not quick to find uh, the stuff that we're most interested in. So here I've got everything, all of my keywords are entered one in each box and I haven't even worried about synonyms just yet. And I just kind of want to take over or take a look over the list. You'll see that they give us a figure from each one of these uh, patents. 
And here is one that turned up uh, earlier and I just you know set it aside. This is a dispenser container for meter dispensing of a product. So you can see that this is probably this is probably something that we might be interested in. You can page through all of the uh, the images right here or right here and read the abstract, the title, and for now, like I say, for the first you know hour or two of a patent search, I, my opinion is that you shouldn't even look at anything else because you've got a lot of ground to cover. So don't even bother with all this uh, all this other text. You can see how how much of it there can be. Patents for mechanical inventions are ten pages for software. They can be fifty pages for stuff in the biomed field. They can be over a hundred pages. So you don't want to get in and read too much. Just Focus on figures in the abstract. Copy down when you see something that's of interest. Just grab the number, or you know, you can just grab this link right here and set it aside uh, in a little uh, in a little note field. Um, the thing that I want to that I want to point out, though, the thing to keep track of right now are these classifications. <coughs> Sorry, these classifications. So this is how you're going to uh, narrow your field of search down very quickly. So like I was saying before, in the US, there could be 20 million documents, but if you figure out how to get a good classification uh, entered into that, uh, that Google search window, you could get that 20 million down to you know, 100,000 and then down to 10,000 and then down to 1,000. You know, if you if you if you can limit it, limit your search with one of these classifications. So what I what I would do is take a hold of all of these, copy them, and then just start a little list like I have done right here. So this little list represents the uh, the classifications from several of the patents that I have uh, that I've already found, and we'll just tabulate it and just move on. So. Here is here's another a different patent that I have found, and like you know just based upon the title and the abstract, I already know that it's going to be uh, relevant, and so I just grab a hold of that classification, add it to my list, and then just move on. And here is here's another one that came off of one of those search lists. Time. Cigarette dispenser, as you can see, patent um, uh, patent field, or I mean, um, the patent search is almost always going to show you that things are much more crowded than what you uh, than what you would have guessed before you started the patent search. It is true of every single search that I've ever done. Uh, more stuff turns up um, and seemingly right next to each other and seemingly similar to each other. Uh, more of that stuff always turns up than you think it's going to. So the key is, I mean, you just have to, you've got to get a bunch of these uh, and then take a look at them and then figure out how you are different from those. So again, okay, here are more classifications. So I'm going to just copy those over to my list. And then I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the list uh, after I've got, um, after I've got a few, uh, after I've got a few entries. So after I've looked at five or six patents that seem to be kind of similar, I'm going to just take a look at this list of these codes. These are called CPC classification codes. There's a few different classification systems out there, but CPC is the common one now. It's the only one that you will see in Google, and um, it's the way that the U.S. Patent Office is classifying everything now. So their old classification system is basically gone. The only the only remnants of it you will see are on the um, the old PDF documents which will show the old US classification. But CPC is um is something that came over from Europe uh, you know 10 years ago. I, I'm not sure exactly when, but that's all we use now. And this is what they look like. So they have uh, four characters to start, and then there's another 
you know, four or five characters with a slash. But if we just look at these first four, this is called the main classification. And if you just put your, if you just scan over this list really quickly, you can see that there's a lot of repeating. So what I want to do is show you what each one of these repeats. So B65D shows up a lot. A24F shows up a lot. So what we can do is just take those and go over to this uh, the classification website, which is also, it'll be in that, um, it was on one of those slides and I can get it to Andrew to send out if, if anyone wants to see it. But this is the class schedule at the USPTO. And you'll see that the CPC uh, selector is on. So if I just stick one of these classifications in there, B65D, I can see that everything in B65D relates to containers. So that means that I could use B65D to narrow this whole search down because we, we, we want something that is a container. So I could just search for B65D and smoking and quitting. And right at what I've done there uh, is I've turned this search from a search of 20 million documents into a search of, you know, 100 to 200,000 documents. So it's a, it's a, it was a big jump. Uh, the other, let's see, the other important classifications, one that, the one that seemed to be showing up, this one, A24S. So if you go back to this website, we'll just go right back to that home page, put this in A24F, and you see that this one, everything in A24F relates to smokers requisites, matchboxes, simulated smoking devices. So basically anything related to smoking should show up here. And again, if you then, if you then do a patent search you, using this as a limitation, you'll see that everything should relate to a smoker's device. So that means that instead of searching 20 million, you're searching you know, 50,000, 100,000. I'm not even sure how big these, these things are all different. You'll see also below, which I'll get into this a little bit more in a second, but below this main classification, there are a bunch of subclassifications or, organized in a tree. And the real, the, the, the real goal for us is if we find a really good sounding subclassification, because that means that we'll get ourselves to a spot where we're looking at maybe four or 500 documents or 300. I mean, it's, they, some of them are very small. But for right now, we'll just be very happy that we have found, um, that we found this one so that we, can, uh, that we can cut the size of the field down to 100,000. So if I take A24S and go back to, go back to Google, and I'll just start over here, and I stick in A24S, uh, you'll, you'll see that right off the bat, everything relates to smoking. So if I just take some of my keywords and um, and put them in, and I don't even need to worry about the word smoking, you'll see because everything already 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 relates to it. So uh, let's just see. This is. There's all this vaping stuff that shows up now. This this search used to be really really good to demonstrate, uh, and now they're <laughs> they changed it up on you, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but basically, so I, I'm in a much much smaller um, a much smaller uh, field. So the next thing I want to uh, show is that as you keep on as you keep on adding to this list of classifications, you can continue to narrow yourself down by finding the subclassifications, which are, you know, really, really uh, good for your invention. So in this case, I can see that this one, this one, F15 slash 005 shows up here, it shows up here, it's here. So it was listed on several of the documents that I've already looked at. So I'm gonna wanna look to see what that classification is because it's probably a very good one. So if we go back to um, to the uh, PTO website, put that one in, and then uh, bring it up. 
So here is A24F 15 slash 005. This, like I say, it's organized in a tree. So the way that you read it is you, you start at the top of the tree, which is here. And this one says receptacles. And then you move out one indent to this. So this, this is a narrow, uh, this is a narrowing of this one. Um, just as another example, uh, let's say that you were more interested in this one right here. Uh, it would be, this one is inside of this one. I don't know if that's easy for you to see or not, but this, this one has two dots right here. So you go down and you find the first one dot. So this one is inside of this one. And then, this one is inside of this one. So it continues to narrow down the scope of, um, uh, of what's contained in that subclassification. But anyways, this one you can see, we have a receptacle or box with means for limiting the, the frequency of, of smoking, like a time control mean. So this one is basically right on the money. So we take this one, this, this subclassification back here and you can put it in and you can even get rid of all of your, um, get rid of all of your keywords. Yeah, they don't like uh, the spaces. And you can see that even Google says right here that there's only 183 results. So it's like, it gets, it gets to the point where you can almost look at all of these uh, patents. And everything in here is going to be relevant and the reason, the reason is, is that we found a subclass that has, you know, that, that really read on the invention. So I guess the, I guess the real lesson here is don't, don't think of yourself in the, in the first phases um, as searching for patents so much as you're searching for subclasses. As soon as you find good subclasses, the whole thing becomes really um, much, much easier. So, okay. And here's the yeah here's east uh, east space. We can go back here and turn um, turn all these other uh, authorities on to see what's in there. Uh, you can see that Google makes it. These are all representative of country codes. So um, and they put the most common ones up on top. So W O is uh, WIPO. Uh, U S is obviously U S. EP, JP, EP is European Union, um, JP is Japan, KR is Korea, CN is China. Um, back to uh, WIPO. WIPO is, um, it's, it's an international authority that um, allows you to file an application and then have it examined and then have it moved uh, efficiently into other countries. But it doesn't, there's no such thing as a WIPO patent. But there, there are still lots of WIPO publications, and like we said, everything is um, uh, everything that's published is in play. Uh, so okay, so I turned all these uh, other countries back on, and I can see. Let's see, did any non U? There's a European patent right there, and of course it's in German. It looks like. Um, so that's that's not super <laughs> that's not super convenient, but uh, fortunately, if you click, yeah. So Google will um, Google will yeah they they have uh, they've translated it for us. So Google again is pretty awesome. Uh, let's see. These like I say again, these other selections are not as important for patentability. Uh, let's see. eSpace is, I, I guess we don't really need to go there because I, I think that, um, I think that Google does a pretty good job. But I'm, okay, so I, right now I have, I've shown you what I wanted to show and I just want to see what kind of questions there are at this point. We got, we got a good question from George. Um, have the sub, and he's very experienced with patents, have the subclasses been honored sufficiently so once it has been whittled down to a subclass or two can the others be dispensed with as you go forward i think it's a good question 
Yeah, that yeah, that is. So um, when okay, so when I deliver a patent search, uh, I usually deliver ten subclasses, you know, so I can tell. But you know, I mean, people are paying me to do this. So when I get to you know five to ten, I'm pretty comfortable that uh, that I've that I've got enough stuff in front of me, um, you know, to you know to, to to be able to deliver. I think that for what you're doing, if you see something that if you see a subclass that really reads nicely on the invention, I think that uh, you can dispense with the others. The only the only uh, the only caveat, I guess, is uh, back to this list here. A24 related to um, tobacco and B65 related to containers. It's probably a good idea to keep the B65 around uh, just because it's, it's possible that a patent, a, a good reference could be classified just as a container, even though it has these other functions. I think you've seen that these can have, that a patent can have multiple classifications, but I would, you know, I wouldn't throw away that uh, that entire uh, all of B65, but I get okay. So generally, if you have two or three that look pretty good, I think that you are okay uh, to um, you know to dispense with the others. Let's see. Uh, Joni says, "Can you trust Google with the search engine with Google and Alexa and privacy issues? Would you be concerned at all?" So I think what you get these questions from inventors too, but I think oh, people yeah, are thinking yeah. it, so might as well ask it. I mean, inventors are thinking like, oh, they're going to look at what I'm searching for and then come to some conclusion or sell that search data. I mean, is that, could that really be a problem for most inventors? People I mean, ask that though. Yeah, I know. It's, um, but so I'll, I'll tell you, there's, there, there are some stories from years ago about, um, and I, I, I hope I don't get in trouble for even for, uh, for saying, you know, for kicking dirt on these companies. But there, there supposedly um, th there was an old search engine which we all used to use called Delphion, and supposedly uh, they did. It was it was a private company that was offering um, the search engine out to, for free, but they were supposedly looking at things. But I just cannot believe that Google would use the information for anything other than advertising to you. Um, there's just so much, there's just so much stuff going through there. But at the same time, and okay, and also Google is in a partnership with the uh, government uh, related to dissemination of patent data. I haven't read that exactly, but I'm sure I, I'm sure that part of that agreement would be that uh, that you're that we're not going to um, steal inventors' ideas because that's you know it's it's not something that it's not something that would be the interest of uh, the you, US even if now. even if they wanted to they're seeing what you search they're not seeing your actual invention they'd have to make a, they'd have to put a lot of brain yeah. work not just data yeah. mining into that can yeah, I talk a little bit yeah. yeah, let me talk a little bit about this. It's hard enough to knock on their doors with potential licensees, follow up, you know, pre you know, present it correctly with great marketing material to get them to even look at it, let, let alone think that someone from Google is looking at what you're searching for to steal it. It's a stretch. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's still, maybe... Maybe what you're searching for, they could sell you on something maybe later. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I do see. I do see advertising that, like, I wonder how did they, how did they know that I was interested in that? And it's, it, they are, they are, they are snooping on you a little bit, but it's, it's more about advertising. And, yeah. and now that's why you're smoking lots of cigarettes, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> right. I just, I just don't see them looking at it and go, wow, that's a great idea. I don't see it. I just no no. Uh, <laughs> funny. Oh. So where are we going from here, Patrick? Uh, you know something that was that was what I wanted to show. I but I mean we could we could start up a new search if you want. No no I we got Good some idea. questions we can jump in with questions here. Sure. Yeah let's okay. do that. Um, let's see. Your good friend and our friend, Kevin Prince, uh, 
patent agent, uh, said, any way to search unpublished applications or are those still secret? Thank you those for the good are, question, Kevin. Those are secret. Yeah, Kevin. That Kevin was put a softball on the tee for me. Those are <laughs> those are those are secret. So the the what what he's getting at is that the um uh the applications that you submit, uh they publish eighteen months after you after your priority date unless you make a special request that not have them published, which is uncommon. So it's just something for inventors to be aware of though. Uh, if, you, if you try to have a search done and one of your competitors filed an application a month ago and you're worried about what they're up to, it's unfortunate for you, but you will not be able to see um, anything that they filed uh, for 18 months. And there's just nothing, it's just kind of a, it's just kind of an unfortunate position for inventors. There's nothing you can really do about it. You just gotta proceed and know that you're taking a little bit of risk there. On that note, people find um, patents that are published but not issued, and then they freak out because they're like, oh my God, they got all this. So I, if you wanna show something, can you show or search for a patent that has been published but not issued so we can show them what to look for there? That would be really helpful. Sure, yeah, so yeah. people realize, oh, they didn't get all these claims. This is what they're trying to get. And they didn't right. get it. So don't freak right. out. So, so um, what, you're yeah, what he's talking about is a published patent application. And here's an example right here. So the way that you can tell the difference real quick um, on a U.S. Uh, document is that an application will have a long number like this where the year is on the front. So this one published in 2018 and then it's got a longer number out here. So basically this is not a patent. Uh, this is for right now, it's just a public disclosure. You can get a look at what they're trying to claim, but uh, you know, it's all, it's all in process at the, at, at the patent office. And then another thing to be aware of is that you know if you're worried about their about their patent stopping your product and not your patents, I know that that's something that you should always try to make sure you have straight in your head um, the difference between stopping a patent, pat, stopping a patent, and stopping a product. Um, this stuff can these public disclosures will stop a patent, but most of these do not become patents. So about half of applications just go abandoned for one reason or another, and then they just sit out here and they sit out here as prior art, but they don't become patents. So there are ways, I mean, if you wanted, if you wanted to take a look, there are ways to, uh, there are ways to find out what the status of an application is to see if, uh, to see if it is abandoned or to see if it's pending in front of the office. And also, since we're on that note of abandoned versus not abandoned, every everything from before two, you know the year two thousand is uh, expired. Well, I should, well, most everything. Most uh, there are some clever clever guys out there that figure this, that figure out how to extend life. But as a general rule, everything twenty years old is expired. So you only have to worry about that stuff as prior art. And then I found in looking at patents over the past 20 years, you know, starting in 2000 up to now, that I, I would say less than half of those are up to date on their maintenance fees. So the, the, the number of things that can affect your product is, um, is a much, much smaller subset of the whole, you know, 20 million that I talked about uh, earlier. Is that uh, what, what else? What else do we yeah, need? Yeah, that was good. Yeah, we got a whole bunch of okay. questions here. Okay. Um, this is a really good general question from Tyler. What is the overall goal by doing this search? Not duplicating the product? Question mark. Gathering info for submitting an official utility patent? Question mark. All the above? Question mark or more? So yeah, let's. I think that's good. I mean, it's a pretty basic question, but I mean, I think it's a good question to ask. Um, yeah. why, why do we do a patent search? Why? And I think Stephen and um, Patrick would probably want to talk about that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, to start, uh, 
you, you might find something that is sitting right on top of you, you know, like a single reference that will completely change what you're doing. So that, there's one there's one reason to do it, uh, you know, prior to trying to file an application, for example, you would want to know about those really bad references first. And then next, it, once you get a look at the, uh, the patents that are close, that's when you can go back to the drawing board and either add features or figure out how you are distinguished and make sure that what distinguishes you is Worth, worthwhile, you know, uh, pursuing a patent, but basically, yeah. So you would use that to uh, to strengthen your uh, to strengthen your position. And when you're when your attorney or agent get a hold of the uh, the patent search, they will sub they'll submit it in an IDS for one thing, so that the patent office already knows about this stuff. But they'll also write about the references that are close in the application. And they will say, look, this one has A, B, and C, and this one has C, D, and E, but they, none of these guys show uh, uh, what, you know, the entire picture of what I'm trying to do. And what it does then is it provides a much stronger case uh, for you uh, at the patent office. Because if, if you didn't provide, if you didn't do this background research and something really difficult turned up two to three years later, after you've submitted your patent application, then you could just be dead in the water. So there, I mean, there, those, that's a few reasons. I, I know Stephen has some other uh, well, reasons for doing that. Yeah, let me tell you how dangerous this is, because it happened to me. I filed two patents um, thinking that, you know, there wasn't any prior art. And sure enough, uh, there was. <laughs> and my application didn't work around those those prior arts. So basically the two patents I filed were worthless. I mean, imagine that. Imagine spending all that time and energy filing something just to be notified by a patent examiner that, hey, here's some prior art. And there you found your 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 invention. You wasted time, you wasted money, you wasted everything because you didn't know that something existed out there that could possibly stop you from getting a patent. So it's really critical, especially if you're going to file a non-provisional patent application. You, you have to do, you, or uh, I recommend that you do it yourself, you learn how to do it, and then you hire someone to do a worldwide search. If you're serious about filing a non-provisional patent application, you don't want to be surprised later to, to, to see if you have to overcome those, those prior arts because there's a very good chance you will not be able to overcome them and you've just wasted time and money. We got a bunch of good questions in here. This is one we get all the time. Uh, Russ says, is there any way to search provisional patent applications? Um, Patrick? No, yeah, those are, those are, those do not ever publish. Um, well, except for in, well, they, they don't publish in the databases that we're searching. They, they, it's similar to the, uh, the secret applications. Uh, they, they sit on file for a year, and if an inventor claims the original date of the uh, provisional when they file a non-provisional within that year, then they get that first date. But if nothing happens, no one files anything uh, before that year is up, then the application just goes away and no one ever sees it. So no, it does not, it, it doesn't publish in the way that, um, uh, that the non-provisionals publish. They just, they, they provide dates though for the non-provisional, uh, earlier dates, earlier priority dates. So if you, you file the provisional today and then one year down the road file the non-provisional that uh, linked to the provisional, then rather than 18 months later, uh, the publishing, it would publish just six months later so that you have that, again, you, you're back to that total window of secrecy of 18 months. But yeah, so that's the long answer, but the short one is no, they don't, they don't publish. 
Uh, Keith says, have you ever heard of a dishonest patent searcher? You know, some people were worried about it. You spent hmm. all this time on this product and you're like, no, are they, is the patent searcher going to steal my idea? So what, what's hmm. your take on that, Patrick? Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, it gets back to the, um, to like the, uh, the Google question. I, I see stuff come in all day long and, um, I know, first of all, I know how much it takes. Uh, to get something off the ground. And then also, uh, uh, you know, you, you would, you, you would be committing a crime. You, you're, you know, you've signed some sort of agreement. I, I send out a, uh, uh, I send out a, a non-disclosure to all my customers. So I'd be violating that. Um, I, I just, I've never heard of, I've never heard of uh, a patent searcher. Uh, stealing an idea and that, that's not to say it's never happened but I, I just I've never heard of it and then the other like the really cynical part of me says um, that you know most most ideas are not they're not worth stealing anyway so it's like there, there's so many and then also like you're you're you would be sending something into a patent searcher you're the one that knows the field the market the competitors you have all this uh, advantage over them they have nothing so yeah, no, I, I just I've never heard of it happening. I'm not saying it doesn't, but I, I just haven't heard of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, this one's from Catherine. It's interesting. What if there is a very vague, general, comparable prior art that was discovered during the patent search? Question mark. And we know that it was abandoned before the patent was issued. What is the risk to me? So I think what she's saying is. Um, you, you somebody's filed a patent but then they abandon it so it's all being publicly disclosed right after right. 18 months but then they abandon it how, how does that become prior art how does that work it's i mean just the fact it that it's published uh makes it prior art and that's mm -hmm. that there's a date on it and it's accessible to the public you know a patent searcher or anyone with a computer can go out and bring it up on their computer uh prior to uh, prior to your um, your filing, so it just means that you're that you cannot get a that, that it's a roadblock to you getting a patent. It's it's the same kind of roadblock as a as an issued patent is. There's no difference. But you can always get a patent on an improvement to that. That's public domain now, and then you can get a patent on an improvement to it. Yeah, on an improvement. But that gets, you know, that becomes a, a question for an attorney and for the patent sure. office because right. the improvement has to be, um, well, it has to be new and non-obvious. That's that's what they will, that's what they'll say is non-obvious. Um, so there has to be some kind of like, wow, improvement, not just, you know, like adding, adding, uh, adding a third condiment to a hamburger at McDonald's would not wow anyone because everyone knows what it's going to taste like when you put. I don't know. I can't even think of what I would put on there to make it different. But you know, it, there has to be some wow factor to the improvement that uh, that nobody else saw coming. Mm -hmm. So we'll we'll end with this one. Let me see if I can pull it over here. Okay, um, Stephen, what did you do after the two prior art patent applications? So what did you do after that, Stephen? Uh, that's what jo Joni is asking. Well, the, the two applications were abandoned. Um, luckily, my patent attorney saw that and they felt responsible for that. Um, so they gave me a, a discount on those, so it didn't cost very much. And then I looked at the two uh, prior arts that uh, were exactly my invention and I didn't walk away um, because when I read them very clearly, I noticed a couple things that were missing. And the, the major things that were missing in those two old prior arts were, were there, there was no method of how to manufacture uh, this particular invention. So that prior art now helped me um, learn from that prior art so i started filing patents on how to manufacture my invention and eventually ended up with 20 patents 
So the prior art was my best friend. And I wish I had had that information a little earlier, of course, but it gave me the roadmap to really understand what I need to file to get my, the ownership of those, of those patents I did ultimately receive. Would it be safe to say you believe in patent searching, Stephen? <laughs> I'm, you know, that's what I'm saying. I'm really a big, big believer in it. Um, mm -hmm. It's so important that um, you just have to, to realize that. If you're serious about going to a non-provisional, um, you have to do it right, or it's going to be, it could be extremely painful. And you don't want to know later after you spent all that money and time. So it's it's really important, right? Yeah. Hey, Patrick, uh, uh, Andrew, I, I want to yeah. show one more thing that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll change it back there. to you. No problem, man. Um, okay, so people were asking about abandoned versus unabandoned. Like I was saying, it's um, it doesn't matter for uh, it it doesn't matter for patentability searching because prior art it's just it's everything. So, but mm. but but sometimes you do want to know if something is abandoned or not um, because you just want to know what they're up to. Are they are this company trying to make this thing or not, um, or are they trying to get this patent or not? I should say. Uh, so if you came over and I'll add this to that little sheet um, and send it to you and you can you can distribute it if if you think it's useful. Uh, these these free resources. This is one more free resource for looking at um, U.S. applications. You'll see up here it's um, it's called Public Pair, and Public Pair is where you can get the the full file history on an application. So basically, starting from its filing point, all the way through all the correspondences between the attorney and the uh, patent office. So it's like it's a it's a giant document, but it has there's some good biblio information uh, that you can get out of there. And so I came back to this list, and I'm curious about this one. Here's a here's a published application from 2014, and I'll just put it in here. Get rid of get rid of the kind the kind code is at the end. Those things are um, a hassle because they're not worth anything. Just take the kind code off, take the US off, so that you just have this 11 digit number sitting here, and then turn on publication number because that's what this is the 11 digits like, like most people would know that right it's like it's very intuitive yeah yeah but then you can just take a look here and here is the information so this one was filed uh on 310 of 2014 and then it abandoned in 2018 right here you can see that it's abandoned so this is one that you don't, I'm not going to say you shouldn't worry about it because these things can be resurrected, but uh, it, it is telling to see that uh, to see that word abandoned right there. And then if you look at the full history, you can see all of these correspondences, all these documents, and this is like, uh, this, this is confusing stuff, but um, I just want to show a couple of key ones, uh, like right there. So the patent office sent out what they call a non-final rejection in 2017, and they didn't hear back from the applicant for six months, and so then uh, the application went abandoned, and that was the end of it. And that's um, I, like I was saying before, half of uh, of patent applications don't go anywhere. 90% of them get that first rejection, and then your attorney or agent will um, on your behalf, uh, argue uh, with the patent office. And sometimes you'll get multiple rejections. Sometimes you'll get a patent. Sometimes you won't. Um, but in about 50% of the cases, um, it, it might even be less than that now, but in about 50% of the cases, uh, these applications just don't go anywhere. And this is the way that you can verify the status is just by going into uh, to a public pair and taking a look. So I'll, I'll add that for your um, uh, to that to that sheet and send it over to you, and then you can provide these resources. Yeah, that would be great. And so how you guys can get that when we put this up on YouTube um, next week, um, right down in the description in the YouTube video. And if you're watching the recording of the video right now, this isn't a recording; it's live. But 
if you're watching the recording, just go down in the YouTube description and we'll have a link there to that info that Patrick wants to share with you. So, um, yeah, Patrick, that was great, man. That was oh, really hey. great. All right, all right. I'm glad. Stephen, did you have anything to say in closing before we? No, I just want to thank Patrick for his time. I think it's really important that we all understand this is, it's important. And we need to take the time to understand the landscape that our invention kind of falls into and, and not be afraid of it, but learn from it and keep on playing with it. And if you need extra help doing it, um, reach out to someone. I know Patrick does a great job. He's done work for me. Um, but it's important to do. So just, like I said, um, just realize if you're going to file a non a non-provisional patent application and you're going to be spending big dollars, make sure you do a very thorough patent search and make it worldwide. Thank you, Patrick. Yes. Okay. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's tremendously complicated, but I think the first time you do anything in life, it's always harder. So I think, you know, follow the techniques that Patrick is is using. And probably the second time you do a search, it's going to be a lot easier. So I think it's a worthwhile skill for every inventor to have. So I encourage you guys all to do it and use the great information that Patrick has shared with you. Thank you. Yep. yep. And don't don't put a week into it. Uh, you get you get out past a couple of days, you should uh you're, you're probably going to run into you're going to run to the end of your uh ropes with it but yeah yeah i would just do um uh, get be ready to hire someone um if you don't find anything but if you do find stuff that's great because you didn't have to pay you didn't have to pay for it right. and these, we got these just web resources are great tons of nice comments for you patrick everybody thanking you and you guys did a great job with your questions really great questions we can never get to them all but we got to a few of them and I just want to remind everybody to take care and keep inventing. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody.